Um, this is the title, Engaging with the Science of Inheritance in Informal Science Spaces. But I'm talking about this from the perspective as a philosopher. So for my, most of my academic life and most of the people within my part of the ivory tower, we've been concerned with the following question because we are sort of historians and philosophers that live amongst the scientists. So, so there's questions coming from outside and questions coming from our inside us as well is how is history of science, how is philosophy of science relevant for science? What can these do for the practice of science? How can they improve science? How can they help science? But there's also another question that is even more difficult and less discussed, which is how can history of science, how can philosophy of science help the public engagement of science? Now, why is this an issue? The three kinds of questions would be raised when we, when we think about the top two and how it relates to the third. So one response is, why would we care about history of science when we're trying to teach science, educate science, or communicate science? Isn't history of science, by definition, outdated science? Why, why, I mean, this, this, for many, this is just the first chapter of the textbook. Look at all these brilliant shoulders of giants that were standing up. Okay, now we move on. Now we teach the current, uh, current stuff. Second is, well, okay, maybe history has a, has, a, has a place as the first chapter. Where the hell would philosophy go? Isn't philosophy mere speculation? Now, there's another saying that maybe you have um, some experience in is that, oh, once a science finally matures, it peels off philosophy and it becomes its own. And then I remember because my master's thesis was done in a psychology department that it only recently split from philosophy department and they were so happy about it. Mm -hmm. So, but then there's also a third question, and it's from science to science. How can we introduce the latest science to school students? Now, why would this be the, an issue? Well, if you really start to think about it, there are a lot of um, pushback against bringing the latest frontier or cutting edge science into schools, especially if we're talking about middle schools and high schools. Can we please think about the children? What if we teach them something wrong? What if it ends up that there is significant scientific disagreement going on here and that what we tell them are not actually the facts? So we, we need to teach them something that is settled, really, really, really settled. And then another issue is if we teach them the latest science, wouldn't it be too difficult we should, we should, like, first things first, teach them the basics, the building blocks. And what are these building blocks? Usually in life sciences, the building blocks now are molecular biology, the central dogma. These are the building blocks, Mendelian genetics, that we go over again and again and again because we keep wanting to do first things first, but then we never get to the second step, it seems like, over and over again. In the school, we teach this. Outside of the school, we reinforce this. And then a final issue is curriculum change really does take a very, very long time. When these things get settled, turn into curriculum change, maybe a decade has already passed, and some of us in the audience have experience in that. So this is um, our little adventure and trying to deal with these issues head on. How can we bring history of science, philosophy of science, and new science of inheritance into public engagement of science? And one way we can enter this space is through informal science spaces. What are informal science spaces? Formal science spaces are education systems, middle school, high school, mandatory education, and beyond. These are formal spaces. Informal spaces are museums, zoos, science centers. These are places where a lot of new ideas can be explored without the oversight of, you know, Ministry of Education saying that the curriculum has to be like this, has to be like that. No, it's a space where you can bring in ideas, work with museum curators, and develop new ideas. So we worked with, under the same project that is hosting this Mendel um, Symposium, the DEC50, DEC50, um, immersive Science Center that is at the top floor of the Natural History Museum of Vienna. This is a brand new space that opened up just last year, well, delayed because of the pandemic, and it is a 
space that has lab um, equipment, space that has places where you can do art activities and interactive theater, all kinds of activities. We are the first externally funded program to join them and to bring uh, Mendel into the museum through the occasion of his 200th birthday. So here, history, right? <laughs> we have occasion to talk about history of science. We have occasion to discuss the update of the science and new science of inheritance to bring in philosophical ideas about how science works as well as philosophy of biology ideas about how inheritance works. So this is our team that has been developing projects within the space. Our actual team is much wider than this, but these are the main people that I will be talking about. And what I'm going to say from this point onward is not that we have a single solution or like the solution to how to do this. What I want to do with this talk is to inspire you to think about all the talks that have been happening today and the work that you're doing and how you can work with science engagers and science communicators to do something fun in an informal science space. For example, Eva mentioned that you challenge your students to think through the basic assumptions of Mendel's paper. How can we do a version of that in an informal science space? Uh, Greg Raddick, he works on counterfactuals. What ifs? What if the debates of the past were different and we have a different scientific dogma now? What would we play that scenario with the students? The toy cases that Maria talked about, what if we run thought experiments with students in an informal science space? There are so many things we can do. So what we did, this is the poster that the Natural History Museum put together, and it's called 200th um, Air Gregor Mendel, The Riddles of Inheritance. It consists of two school workshops that schools in Austria can sign up, and um, we fund them. Uh, the central issue for me here is that everything has to be in German. <laughs> but um, we worked it out. We are a fabulous team, and our team also include DeepL and Google Translate. So <laughs> we, have, we developed four programs under these two workshops. The first one is Meet a Scientist, Meet Mendel, and a microscope lab where we stain chromosomes, a science quiz on inheritance, and an art science game, Mendel's Fantastic PBs. So I will go through these to um, discuss how we put together. But this is, uh, yeah, we what is especially mentioned that thanks to Interreg, we are able to fund 20 classes and we prioritize marginalized schools. So this is how I'm going to talk about each program. I'm first going to talk about how it started because I deeply believe that we need to use the special properties of the space we had as scaffolds to develop our programs. Instead of thinking of it abstractly, you know, maybe we do this and then we bring it in and then it might not fit into the infrastructure or it might be awkward. So first we look at what the Deck 50 has to offer, what kind of formats it has and what kind of resources we have there. Then we design it based on our own principles and then we workshop it in the different, in the, in the, each program has its own workshop process. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you more about that. And then I'll tell you a little bit of how it went because it's still ongoing right now, October, November, if you know anyone, who knows anyone in Austrian schools, they can still sign up at the Natural History Museum. So first one, meet Mendel. Where are Mendels? Mendel number one, Mendel number two. So we recruited um, two master students to be our Mendels um, in this interactive theater performance. Now, what is the Deck 50 resource for this? They have this giant string that you just saw. It is interactive in the sense that participants can have this little board with a QR code. You can run, as you go through the theater, you ask them questions, they raise the board, and it's effectively a poll so that they can vote for their answers anonymously, and they can see in real time what other people are doing and adjust their answers, and then they can ask questions as they go. And so it forces an interaction between you and the students so the students are not just sitting there listening to you lecture. And then they encourage that in the middle, they have this 10 block format that I have intentionally blurred because it's propriety. <laughs> so <laughs> in it, the step by step, they provide this as a template for scientists. Anyone who wants to work with the Deck 50 will receive this format and then you can fit in your work to their format. So we have this thing to start as a starting point. So what did we do? First, we had an inspiration. The meet a scientist idea 
originally was for scientists, real world scientists, to come in and tell stories about their scientific life. This is to inspire students to feel like they can actually do this. Here's a real scientist and telling how I did it, what's so cool about it, brilliant pictures, feel inspired. So we thought, hey, what if we have Mendel be that scientist? So we have Mendel come up, talk about himself as Mendel. So then we transport Mendel then from the past to talk to students of now. That's the premise of our show. So these Mendels come and then they, Mendel tells them their story, they interact with Mendel. So this is the science communication philosophy um, based principles that we really wanted to feature inside our show. We wanted to show Mendel as a scientist. We wanted to show the scientific process, not just the paper that's published at the, at the end. We want to show and investigate the epistemic role of emotions in science, curiosity, disencouragement, frustration, and so on and so forth. So this is really acted out by our two Mendels after they studied his life. Um, very important is the epistemic role of failure in science. Failure is important. It's not just the successes. And the importance of a supporting community for scientists, it's not a lone wolf phenomenon. You need to have a community. Um, of course, they have to be funny, and I can't make jokes in German, so I just have to trust that you guys actually were funny, right? <laughs> You're funny? <laughs> funny? <laughs> and then um, the ethical societal consequences of scientific activities. And this, to me, big heart, is how idealizations and simplifications in science help promote new scientific developments, but would in turn limit it. So this is deeply inspired in part by um, Greg Raddick's work when he goes back to talk about how the debates between the Mendelians and Weldon and how they, how one debate particularly won out and led to the dominance of Mendelism today. And part of the issue of that debate is whether the simplifications that Mendel did at the time were justified or not, whether the complexities that he left out um, re actually revealed um, important features of inheritance. So we want to somehow bring this in, that Mendel made idealizations and simplifications that was good for some things, but not everything. All right, so we, using the 10-point framework as a starting point, we divided it into three acts. Mendel joins the Abbey and becomes a scientist. Mendel's experimental process itself, as he puzzles through it, and then how Mendel reacts to current science, which is the part where we want the idealization simplification aspect to really come out in a take home message. So the interactive questions, they recommend five questions. So we put five in where they can do the board thing. Do you think that a monk can be a scientist? Yes, no, it's, you know, it's engaging, fun little questions. By the way, these are for 14 year olds. Um, what does a monk need to carry out scientific experiments? Um, how would you have first tried to solve this puzzle after we present the puzzle, after he presents his own puzzles, like, oh, I was doing this, was doing that, what should I do now? You know, that kind of thing. And then which hypothesis is the most likely? So hypothesis-based reasoning. Um, and then who can be a scientist, really? If Mendel can be a scientist, can we all be scientists somehow? So then, so this part I did, and then I gave it to the two Mendels. And the two Mendels then worked on it based on their own interpretation of my work here. And so we have the German script here. And then we included Maria, who put a lot of effort into going to Bruno, thank you, and to other places to collect um, fill, uh, footage for them to show while they are giving the presentation. So that's how we designed it and how did it go. So I was amazed. <laughs> so the first batch of students that we had with Severine here, they, so I think we, we, we meant for this to be an hour and it went on for two hours and they wouldn't stop. It was like, it's noon, we need to go now because their hands were just shooting up and up and they had so many questions on and on, all sorts of questions. So if you have any questions about what questions they asked, please ask Severine because everything was in German. And then, <laughs> What I thought was really cool was then at the end, um, Severine had a little improv moment. He sent Mendel back in time and then took his clothes off. <laughs> took it, only, the, only the robe. Only the robe. <laughs> and then it was like, hello everyone. 
I am student studying genetics. And um, this is like, and then, and then the students got even more excited because here's someone that's very close to them in terms of you know, age and possible career achievement in the near future. So they asked even more questions about, about his life as a, as a genetics student. So this was a very nice uh, two-phase two thing that, that emerged out of this process. So that's the Meet Mendel workshop, it's standalone. The other workshop has three things. So the Riddle Inheritance workshop has a lab, has a science quiz, and an art science game. This is a three hour exhausting workshop whereby they go through all of this in, in addition to a tour in the museum that reinforces every single animal that they meet in the process. So these are the three spaces. This is how we started. This is what the Deck 50 offers. The lab space, the art space, and you know, the theater space. In particular, the theater space also came with a 10 block format for us to um, you know, follow if you're a scientist working with them. So we use this again as a basis and inspiration. So what are the scientific um, uh, principles we want to like, really express here? First, there are multiple channels of inheritance. We want to embed Mendelian inheritance with as one of many types of inheritance that can happen. Inheritance is beyond Mendelian genetics. There are many, many other types. One of them is Mendelian inheritance. Um, the second idea is that the genome is reactive to environmental factors. It doesn't contain all the code and action and needs to express itself. It is activated by other things. These other things, many come from different sorts of environment. The third thing we want to um, do is more on the pedagogical side, is inactive tactile-based learning. So the idea here is to circumvent the um, objection that we're teaching them really advanced science stuff that is too complicated and we need to start from central dogma again or something like that. Instead, so we're trying, so this is experimental, this is explorative. How about we don't really tell them what the terms are, we don't even tell them what extended inheritance is or epigenetics is. We just design a process and then they can learn through doing stuff. And then as long as they're having fun, they're excited, they have questions, they can investigate more when they bring this, after three hours, they bring this back to their lives. So we would show more than tell, but maybe we can go even beyond this. We can try more than show, instead of like just maybe through trying, they figure something else themselves and just let them go wild and have fun. So, so let, let, like, I mean, this is, I'm not a pedagogy expert and that's why I like speaking here is that there are so many experts here to, to learn from is what are the learning goals here, but maybe in an informal science space, we need to just you know, get people excited about science and not care too much about learning goals. Maybe I'm wrong. But this is how we designed it. So Barbara and I put a lot of effort here because we realized then that we are not the ones actually teaching anyone anything. There are dedicated trainers who have worked with the Natural History Museum, some for decades. They know the place, they know how to interact with their target audience. They are the science communicators we need to collaborate with. So we need to provide very good manuals that fit their habits and can help them carry out our program. So we created these a lab protocol and two trainer manuals. So each thing is for a particular activity. Each of these trainer manuals, we have the instructions for what to do, but also the explanation, the scientific inspiration or idea behind it that we don't enforce them to explain to anyone, but it's for them to know. So that if a student asks them, they can respond. If they don't, then we just move on as long as they're happy. So for, we covered a lot of different kinds of traits. Um, some are Mendelian, some are diet dependent, temperature sensitive, like uh, sex, uh, uh, temperature dependency of sex. We have microbial inheritance. We have a bunch of non-Mendelian traits and then we have small RNA inheritance, all sorts of things. But as you'll note here, some of these are clearly cases of inheritance, like microbial inheritance passed on across uh, generations as well as small RNA. And some of these are more like, you know, epigenetics as opposed to epigenetic inheritance. So how can we, go from running through these wonderful examples of how traits, uh, how phenotypes are expressed, both by genes and environment, 
to like a concept of inheritance. So that's another thing that we, we added to these activities, and you'll sh I'll, we'll show you soon how this, how this works. But number one, when they enter the space, the first thing they do is the science quiz. So the science quiz goes through these different examples, and with each example, we have some questions for them. What do you think is happening here? What do you think determines this? And then they kind of guess. In most cases, they guess correctly. For example, with the flamingo case, why is the flamingo red? They're like, yeah, because it's eating things that make it red. And then like, oh, okay, you, kind, you guys kind of know. But some things they have no idea, like small RNA inheritance. Um, do you think that immunity can be transmitted between nematodes? Um, they're like, no, it's impossible. But then, yeah, you can do that through small RNA. They're really surprised and they learn something new. So after the quiz, they then split into two groups. One group goes to the lab, one group goes to the art, and then they exchange. So at, in the lab space, what they do here is they stain chromosomes with this very simple home method that Barbara developed. <laughs> that Barbara introduced to the space. And then they get to um, look at chromosomes after talking about different types of inheritance for, for some while. The other group, goes into the art space, and here they create Mendel's Fantastic Beasts. So what are Mendel's Fantastic Beasts? So this idea I <laughs> spent a lot of time developing, and I asked a lot of people for their advice, including Scott Gilbert, and then I took in a lot of feedback and brainstorming efforts with my teammates that it's hard to attribute who like credit anymore. Like This is teamwork. So the idea here is this. We give them a mission, a story. So help villagers um, uh, inherit in Mendel's pea garden. And this pea garden is now under stress because of different kinds of climate change issues. So I list like seven reasons why the pea garden is under threat. We need to protect Mendel's peas. So please, design a pea beast um, that can protect the peas write down the recipe and pass it down to the villagers so that they can replicate it. Now that's the inheritance component. They need to write the recipe and they need to pass it down. Okay, that part is inheritance. What do they need to write down? They need to write down um, the Mendelian, non-Mendelian traits and the traits that are activated by different environments and diets. And we do not have a sequence here. It's all mixed together. So it's all equal. <laughs> So these are the, I won't go into the details of these traits, but we have probably six or seven rules. A lot of these rules are developed from um, evil devil studies, developmental genetics, and as well as eco evil devo. So we have different ways to color the beast, different parts. Some of these are Mendelian, and then they take these cards. If it's dominant, it's this. If it's recessive, it's that. Some of them, they throw a dice. There's a point mutation that triggers a different developmental circuit, such that a different limb, kind of limb will grow. And some of these are gradual transformations, um, like this thing that they turn, a gradual transformation that could have a large morphological effect on the overall body plan. So all these things, we just put it in there, but we don't tell them what body plan is, for example. None of this is explained. It's just games that they go through. And then after they go through that, they assemble it. So this is just expressing the process of prototyping and designing this game. Did a lot of work at home with my little papers. And then Catherine, the graphic designer, helped us beautify it. And then we have a laser, <laughs> laser cutting um, business help us create the laser pieces for the um, students to put together. And then Severin and I put, test ran this thing to put together um, beasts. And this is um, the setup at the Natural History Museum where we, ha we have these different stations and these different stations, they play the games, collect the parts, color the thing, and so on and so forth. Again, there's no sequence. And so, like I said, um, throw a die, so you have point mutations, draw cards for Mendelian traits, so on and so forth. So, that's, that, that's the design process, if, if you can keep it in your head clearly. We have the art science game, we have a lab thing, and then we have the science quiz. So how did it go? Was it creative? Was it fun? Did it like it? Well, first of all, um, the piece. So I want to share something really interesting here. So when I designed this, I had some clear rules in mind, right? The, like these are the rules whereby you get the parts or the colors, or the, the textures, and so on, and then you put it together. And I had in mind 
I thought were obvious rules, but I didn't make it explicit, which is this is a head, this is a tail, you know, this is a wing. So like obviously things go where they're supposed to go. And so these are the, the piece I made that kind of fulfill the, the criteria. The head piece goes in the head part, the, the feet goes in the feet part, so on and so forth. And these are two made by actual students that more or less fulfill those, those rules. But as I was playing this game by myself, I realized something quite interesting, which is these pieces were abstract enough and beautified enough by Catherine that even if I just you know, put a head piece and make it into a tail piece, you know, put a wing piece and turn it into a head piece, it still looks really nice. Like th these three pieces do not satisfy the implicit rules at all. They were meant like, but they look weird and nice. So what do I have here is that these did not break the explicit rules that I laid out on paper, but they broke the implicit and uh, assumed rules that I did not put on paper. So this is an innovation. This is the innovation. This is the exploration of phenotype space within constraints. So this is great because the first time I proposed this game to the um, deck 50, they were really worried about it. One. We're dealing with 14-year-olds to 17-year-olds. Won't they think that this is a boring cardboard animal game? Are you sure you want to do this? And then the second question is, if you already cut out the pieces for them, where's the creativity? What's the fun in this? And I thought, this is it. This is it. I, 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 like, maybe they'll come up with something. And indeed, <laughs> just look at this crazy thing. So this was created by three 14-year-old Austrian boys. If you look carefully, you'll see why some parts they think is really hilarious for a 14-year-old boy. <laughs> and then, um, so these were the, these were the, well, faces blurred. These were the three boys that like, they kept laughing the entire time. It's like, oh, what if we make this stand up like this? What do we put this piece here? Ah. So it, it was, it was that, that was the whole process. And then this happened. Like this was completely unexpected. This had nothing to do with my, uh, what I had in my, in my prototype, but it did satisfy the rules. And so that only did they have so much fun doing it. The other tables came in to give suggestions and it just became a whole thing. So um, there are also developmental failures. <laughs> I found this very interesting that this hit a phenotypic dead end, developmental dead end, this did not happen. And so the, this group just sadly put their pieces there and said, we, we could not put it together. This just isn't a thing. I was like, that's fine. So we need a way to reinforce that. You know, sometimes this happens in nature as well. And here's a quote I got from a middle school teacher when I was observing this activity. When I first heard that there was going to be a painting art activity, I was very skeptical. We are talking about 13 and 14 year old boys. I was quite afraid that they'll be bored or refuse to do it. I'm amazed, they're having so much fun, completely engaged, not a single student asked for their handy, which is a, a smartphone. And, and, and indeed, they were, they thought it was hilarious. <laughs> and, and I think they think it's hilarious because they think they're breaking the rules while following the rules. <laughs> they found a loophole. <laughs> and then here's another quote um, that I think in general is something that anyone who works in the museum will find very uh, heartwarming. So this teacher said, I always find it fascinating that even though young boys want to be strong men and want us to treat them like adults, whenever we bring them to a museum or a zoo, they can turn into children again. They want to play, they want to have fun. And that was um, her comment after our activity ended. So to, to um, I didn't talk too much about the lab space, but in the lab space, they were also fully engaged because not only were, they, were we asking them to look at chromosomes, we are also asking them to stain, to collect the tissue, stain it themselves, and observe it under the microscope after they learn how to use it with a pre-existing sample. So they were all very, very focused on this learning activity. And again, nobody was bored doing that. So to summarize, what we attempted to do with this particular case study was to bring elements of history of science, philosophy of science, and the latest science um, into a science space by the development of science engagement activities and with the very, very nice um, opportunity of like commemorating a historical legend. And in this science, informal science space, we made sure that we first understood what its strengths are, what its structure is, and then we used its strengths and constraints to develop our activities together. So what we really wanted to do in the process, but it's kind of difficult because we were 
like press for time and like really developing this as it goes is to look at this. This is the last slide. So through this process, our experience, we realized that there are multiple layers going on here. First, there are the scientists that a museum would work with. In that case, it's us who are conceptualizing this thing. They conceptualize it, but they don't carry it out. And first, there's another step. They need to prototype within the Deck 50 structures. Some scientists don't have time for this. So then it would be the Deck 50 staff who are using the scientific materials that they got from the scientists to try to adapt it to the Deck 50 format. And this is, was the case for many scientists interacting with Deck 50. But because we had a whole grant behind us, we did this extra step by working with them. But then that's already adding a, a layer whereby some thing is going to change. Now, the third thing, trainers on the ground. Um, with these super experienced trainers, we realize two things that are very interesting. One is that they will have to improvise, not, not because of the students, that's another issue. They have to improvise because there's time constraints, because their background knowledge might not fit what we're telling them. So this is something we really wanted to explore, but we couldn't quite um, figure out how to, how to do this, is a uh, hypothesis would be if they are deeply entrenched in Mendelian genetics, would they focus on getting that part straight, sacrificing the other parts, or teaching the other parts as exceptions, or would they follow our, you know, kind of random order <laughs> format? And we sort of wanted to test this, but um, it was very difficult in that kind of environment to set this kind of thing up. But we now know that they have their own interpretations, how they do this. If they are short for time, they will definitely cut something out. What do they cut out? That's an interesting question. How would they improvise? And then finally, there are some students that are excited and well-informed and interested in science, and there are students that are not. And then at this age group, they easily influence each other. Um, one of the quotes that the teacher told us that, we're lucky that one student laughed and thought it was funny because then everybody else relaxed and thought they could do something funny. If the first student was like, oh, this is shit, then everybody else is going to react that way because of peer pressure. So the dynamics could shift very dramatically with this age group. And that is something they have to react to and again, sacrifice material or change material so that they could better engage with the students. So there are many steps of different things going on, what kind of changes are happening, um, how is it affected by pre-existing biological education and frameworks, and then how can we better understand this and then feed back into the conceptualization phase and then lead to different kinds of science engagement innovations. This is a, you know, future question thing. <laughs> so I want to thank a lot of people. I um, want to thank the DEC50 group. The Iris Old is the head of communications of the Natural History Museum as a whole. Um, Ines is the head of the DEC 50, Agnes is the head of the ped pedagogy and she, unit, and she is the one who's in charge of scheduling everything and making sure that we actually reach schools, reach the right kind of schools and get the students in, and we couldn't have done this without them. These are the DEC 50 trainers and instructors. They are freelancers that are working mostly out of passion. So we are also very, very thankful that they're willing to spend the time and effort to learn our materials, work with us, and carry them out with different kinds of students. So our project is funded by Interreg, Austria Czech Republic project, GJM 200, ATCZ278. I said it, the project code. So <laughs> thank you very much.